The next panelist will be talking and share with us about searching for the next unicorn. So I would like to welcome on stage first to be the panel moderator. Please welcome Mr. Apollo Ono. And also the panelists today will have Jeremy Gardner, Sheldon Inventash, Chris York, Rose Sun, and Eugene Khan. And I will pass the stage to you. Over to you, Mr. Uno. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, this is actually one of my favorite panels of the entire weekend and the reason why I think many of you who are both speculators who own current cryptocurrency investments and assets, um, we're all looking for the next unicorn. We're all looking for the next 100x. We're all looking for the next moon. We're all looking for when this is going to be a 1,000x return in some capacity. Um, all of these distinguished individuals have some very unique experiences and insight into the cryptocurrency sphere. I'll start just very briefly by introducing a few of them. Uh, Jeremy Gardner was a very early and longtime Bitcoin adopter and pioneer. Uh, somewhat stumbled upon Bitcoin, somewhat by accident, but I think buying at the first time price of $8 was a pretty good uh, choice at a very young age. And he's gone and since been very successful in multiple different investments all over the cryptocurrency sector, uh, has been speaking on blockchain-related education, co-founder of Augur, REP. You guys have know all the incredible news coming out of that platform. Uh, and in addition, he just launched his own fund called Awesome Ventures, and he's got some very, very strong, long-standing history of people who are investing and believe in his, uh, his idea set. Shel Sheldon Iwantesh, um, 30 years plus uh, investment experience in traditional capital markets. He's raised over 15 billion for his portfolio companies. Um, he's now attacking the cryptocurrency sector head on uh, and providing what he, I think we all would agree, to have some adult mentality in terms of how he views the, these technologies and the fundamental thesis behind why they have value. Rose Sun, uh, a dear friend and also uh, uh, an amazing Bitcoin and blockchain entrepreneur. She started investing into this space actually fairly recently, however, has had a tremendous rise of success with her fund, Bika Fund, which is based in China. Uh, and she's going to provide some really interesting insight in terms of the differences of the types of technologies and the companies and why we should care so much about Asia in general. Uh, Eugene, uh, the original founding uh, editor of Hypebeast, which is not a cryptocurrency, which is not a blockchain, but uh, has an incredible breadth of millennial generation and, and culture and also adoption. So he brings a very specific type of mindset and also idea behind how cultures adopt trends and why and how millennials really get behind some of these things. We saw Tom Lee share with us some incredible insights and some really key points in terms of the data around what we're seeing that's driving this kind of spurt and growth towards crypto. And I think Eugene can really, uh, really provide some insight there. So I just want to start with one quick question for every single person is, if you were going to identify the key attributes of choosing a unicorn or choosing a 100 or 1,000x return company, what are those elements? Well, it's probably not going to be a company. It's probably going to be one of these new protocols coming out. And it's going to be a protocol token, one of these tokens that's issued out as the incentive mechanism for validating transactions in a block blockchain net network, such as Ethereum or Bitcoin uh, or EOS. Uh, it's less likely to be a utility token used for an application sim like Augur's Wrap um, or Civic's Civic token, simply because so much of the value that um, is attained in these new blockchain networks is at the protocol layer. Now, there will be billion dollar companies, of course. Coinbase already has one, Bitmain has one. But for the most part, a lot of the value is going to trickle down to the protocols that get adopted, of which I imagine there will be six to 12. Got it, got it. Sheldon, you bring a different perspective and you really tend to focus more on fundamentals. Do you want to share with us what you look for in some of these, these assets? Thanks, Apollo. Listen, thanks for inviting me here. Uh, first thing, I don't believe in unicorns or the word unicorn. Um, I believe that uh, it doesn't really distinguish between operating business models and just popular ideas of the time. And maybe I'm altruistic, but 
I believe that uh, wealth and change occur in the long run, and I believe that there's too much focus in the, this industry in the short run. And what I'm seeing uh, in my mind is just going back to basic principles, you know, business, this is, it's disruptive, which means there's change, but there's real value add to many enterprises that just need to be educated and trust uh, others entering into, for example, their supply chain and leakage and, and traditional business sets where blockchain enables the ability of corporations to become, as one example, the enterprise market, way more efficient. And I call this a low-hanging fruit, and I believe that these corporations are going to be many times um, uh, unicorn size, but based on the reality. And yes, there are a ton of protocols, and uh, everybody will argue why theirs is scalable. Uh, none have been demonstrated. And I believe that there will be a new wave of technology. But from my perspective, I really focus on the traditional uh, metrics of, you know, do they have a management team that can execute? Yes, there's a lot of great technical people. I believe that this industry is enriched with technical people, but uh, lack on the fact that there's other pieces to the management team that are necessary for it to be, I'll call it a commercial blockchain success. Thanks, Sheldon. Thank you. Um, I think I have uh, one simple rules for the team. I think uh, I would check whether the founders truly believe what he wants to accomplish and whether the team has the tracking record and experience ability to build what they claim they're trying to build. But how do you identify track record when you've got 18-year-olds creating protocol layer level security technologies that has never been created for in the history of the internet? Uh, exactly. So you need to look into um, the team members, whether they have, uh, like teenagers, they understand the blockchain fundamentally, and they, whether they have like middle-aged uh, people who are already engaged with a uh, much larger and uh, uh, scaling um, projects, whether they have experience in building um, um, projects like uh, Alibaba, Ma Amazon, uh, and they understand how the company is going and they understand uh, the mechanism of uh, managing people. Uh, if you have like two things combining together, I think you can get a pretty strong team. And all, all the members in that team should have the consensus of building um, the same uh, aiming that they are, um, the, uh, building the same aim they were uh, trying to build. Understand. Eugene, as being one of the partners at TLDR, you look for different types of things in these founders. And a lot of times, we were talking about this earlier, the fundamentals seem to be the same, but the faces keep getting younger. Yeah, I, I would say that in general, the way that I've, I've looked at it, and not coming from a traditional background, like maybe like some of the people on the panel, is that I look at it very much from a marketing and messaging perspective, and almost like a pyramid where... As, as mentioned, like on the protocol layer, I think that's where everyone recognizes where things need to start as a foundation. But then how do you get people aware of your protocol, the value of that, and it trickles down. So ultimately, in a very noisy space, how good are you finding the people that are most relevant for your message? And how can you make sure that it's sustained and on point? So I think that's always going to be a big challenge, whether you're Nike, whether you're a blockchain company. How do you find a way to cut through the noise? And I think ultimately that is what is going to drive sort of this critical mass around it. Because you could, I think right now at this point in time on the, in the digital landscape, it's the best products don't always rise to the top. Traditionally, we've always said, oh, cream rises to the top. I don't think that's relevant anymore, unfortunately, because so many people are throwing noise into the space. Chris, thanks for kind of joining us. I saw you kind of run on stage. Uh, Chris runs Esoteric Capital. Uh, they've got a very interesting uh, mindset around how they hedge risk and how they trade and also how they manage funds. But I'd love to hear some you from, from you, your perspectives on what we saw in 2017 and what is to come in 2018 in terms of where you guys are placing your funds. Well, one interesting thing to, to look at is that a lot of these projects, uh, about 50, last time I checked, they have more money in the bank than their token is actually worth, right? And I think a lot of these guys are gonna back into being these incredibly wealthy um, companies that launch funds and basically have a, uh, you know, um, so much money that that's 
primarily where their value is going to come from is they're going to turn into incubators or they're going to come sort of as like a, a VC sort of play. And you see this with Icon and you see it with other companies where, um, to give one example, Digix Dow raised about 12 million, 15 million. They have a quarter billion dollars now, right? And I think even if these projects go to zero, these companies have so much money that they'll figure something out, whether it's going to be on the finance side, the incubator side, or something else. And a lot of people are starting to go talk to them about things like treasury management investing or helping them set up the infrastructure to themselves becoming um, funders. Interesting. Jeremy, you've been investing in this space for many, many years. What do you think is going to happen for the rest of 2018 versus what happened last year? I don't, I don't really like to speculate on the future. I, that, 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 that's why I created Augur. Uh, but if I were to guess, I'd say we probably have hit the bottom. I, you know, the best investment strategy for 2018 so far would have been to not invest in crypto. Uh, you would have been best served just like waiting for the market to bottom out. But now that we're looking at it, I mean, there seems to be positive investor sentiment. Exchange volumes are really climbing back up quite exponentially. And so I'd say there's probably going to be some sort of rally in the markets. It's hard to say how much. Uh, you know, right now at, you know, at $7,000, a Bitcoin price requires like $600 million new dollars of capital coming into the market every single month, which is a lot. And so it would take real institutional capital coming in with no ETF on the horizon, you know, and custodianship still not totally figured out. It, it, you know, I don't think we're going to see anything uh, parabolic like we did at the end of 2017. Sheldon, you know, we always talk about fundamentals and you've got, and you're working with many different companies who are taking their existing model and they're simply tokenizing them in many different ways. What do you think the future is going to be for some of these larger companies and how they scale and utilize blockchain related tech in, in your investments? Sort of merge, you know, maybe the, the two questions here in a way is I'm seeing now, uh, compared to say six months ago, I'm kind of a newbie in this sector. You know, I've just turned one and a quarter. Um, and, uh, but on the other hand, people that start, you know, it's amazing how much you, the knowledge uh, that, that you have versus them. But uh, I'm seeing better quality projects than I've ever seen that really stand together. And many of them were not the loudest guys in the room or maybe were never in the room. In fact, some teams uh, purposely isolated themselves from other blockchain companies and developers and really came up, have come up with really unique uh, business propositions that, that you can see that they can be executed, that basically buy in the partner in the real world uh, that now realizes, and I like to use the word blockchain rather than crypto, uh, the, the value proposition, and then you have really a real partnership. And then every time a company gets into blockchain, they realize that they want to get more into it. And that's, to me, you know, the name of your your conference hybrid, I believe we're in a, in, in a hybrid transformation. So I would just say that I think that it's uh, times are very robust but quiet. And from my standpoint, it's uh, a much more enjoyable, less pressured environment. Higher, higher, higher quality projects. I think we all welcome those. Um, this question is for Rose and for Eugene. Being both based in Asia, uh, your deal flow is significantly different than perhaps many of us even in the room. So how do you filter through the noise? Like, for example, when we look at China-based projects, it's very difficult for us to validate who is actually really building it. Has this white paper already been written before? Does this team even exist? Are these real faces? Very, very, very difficult to have, right? So if I see, you know, Ryan Reynolds on the advisor list, usually that's a red flag, but in China it's very, very difficult because they're so good at creating or even copying other technologies. How do you do it? Uh, first, let me share some figures inside China. We have right now 300k projects in China for blockchain. And uh, for exchanges, we have 85k exchanges. And uh, you, know, you have 18,500 cryptocurrency exchanges inside China. Yes, yes. When the Chinese government says that cryptocurrency exchanges are illegal. Uh, That's incredible and creative. <laughs> yeah, and also we have 50k media inside China about blockchain and uh, 2,000 uh, uh, mining machine manufacturing factories and uh, 600 uh, mining pools. So, um, so 
comparing to the user, the real users and the real people who would trade on exchanges in China, which we uh, estimated the number is around three million. So when, when you uh, divide it by the exchanges, it's almost only 35 people on ex each exchange. So that's crazy. So um, right now, uh, what we do is the Chinese projects that are approaching us or exchanges approaching us, we would ask for um, whether this team have uh, things that differentiate from others, uh, whether they have technologies that can be a monopoly from other uh, projects. It's just like common Peter Thiel questions, what do you know that other people don't know? So um, that is uh, one question that we ask. And I also ask uh, all the teams to take uh, one pictures to show me that everybody you claim to be on your white paper is actually working together. Eugene? Yeah, for us, I don't think our due diligence changes based on the region per se. What we do focus a lot on is just building network and I think you recognize that the way we communicate globally is different like if you send an email to someone in Asia the likelihood of getting replied to is probably slim but if you hit them up on WeChat there's a better chance you'll get a reply so knowing that you're on the ground you know connecting faces and I think at this current point in time in the space kind of real recognize real and good people generally attract each other so you're trying to rely on other people that you trust that you know have a good track record and use that as sort of the signal as if something's relevant if chances are that you hear about a project that's supposed to be massive and someone you trust on the ground in china and korea hasn't heard of it there's probably a chance that you might have to dig a little bit deeper into that and i think that's still the one thing that blockchain won't solve is like there's a humanistic layer that still needs to exist there and we're all here on stage interacting with one another and i think that's still very important and that's one thing I hopefully never really gets reduced because it, it just sort of discounts what it means to be human, right? Just like connecting with people, hearing different perspectives and hearing people's voices. Chris, can you share with us some of your guys' team advice in terms of how you do your due diligence when also surveying companies and deciding to bring them on board? Well, um, we don't really invest in ICOs. We invest for a lot of ICOs. And actually, um, that's one of the problems where we can't even accept money from them if they didn't do adequate KYC AML, right? Because it puts us at risk and it puts everybody that we work with at risk as well. So um, the, the major thing is as they build more kind of um, typical, like approved and rubber stamped setups in different jurisdictions like Malta, Gibraltar, et cetera, for ICOs, that makes it easier for us and the people that we want to invest with us like traditional finance to actually um, participate in the ICO ecosystem. For all the people who are in the room who have companies or they, they're building some kind of development on their protocol layer level technology or they're running an existing business and they're trying to tokenize it, can you give me just some quick bullet points, each of you, of what they should really be concentrating on? Because there's so much noise in this space. There's so much marketing. You're getting pulled in every conference, every which direction. How do you make sure and ensure that you've got enough roadmap and leeway to make sure you can actually create the product that you intend to? The first question is, do you need a blockchain? And 90, 95% of the time when a company first asks themselves that, the answer is no. Maybe like 98. Uh, it, you don't usually need a blockchain for most businesses. And if you do, it's probably over the long term as you think about decentralizing, like disintermediating yourself. But it's typically not something you need right away. It's part of a solution. And then if you are going to issue a token, you have to ask, do I need a token? The answer then is probably not, 99% uh, of the time. And then if you are going to create a token, and you probably are, um, even though you don't probably need one, you have to think, do the economics of this token make sense? Can I incentivize people to use this token and increase the value of this token over time? Does it align the incentives of all the players in the value chain, from the founding team to the employees, to the consumers of the product, to any enterprises that are involved? And typically, once you go through that whole process, you realize why you don't need a token to begin with. But then, if you do, getting those game theoretical incentives correct is utterly important. Sheldon? I don't think there's, um, there's an answer for that, other than every team has to go through its own journey. And that journey should allow for the passage of time. There's too much rushing 
to, you know, get here, see a window, raise money. I mean, I have a project that uh, I'm involved with and I had to get rid of the founder. We have 500 iterations of the white paper, three pivots, and now we found it. And you know what? That, that was hard work. And it was just talking to, trying to get to the best of breed people to really give you honest opinions. And so uh, it's, I, I just think that you have to wear out shoe leather, fly, uh, because you don't find these in your own town. You have to search for them, come to places like this. And every time I go, whether it's large or small, there's always nuggets that I, that I pull away, but it's hard work. So I think you have to talk to people and you have to listen and then you just have to go through that journey with your team and come to real conclusions based on the feedback you get. I would say uh, that team or the funding need to have a much bigger vision and make sure that your community have this, share the same big vision with you. I would say that one of the big things is just self-awareness of being familiar with the market conditions. Like, you know, there's some projects we adv we've advised on um, and they may be stuck in like a late 2017 mindset and I need to raise this much money. But the reality of the situation is that the current market is not looking for that. And you recognize that things are, there's so many smart people in the space that they're getting smarter and smarter. And, you know, you can get fooled once, but you can't fool them twice, right? So, you know, if you're trying to raise $100 million, reality of that right now is probably not going to happen. What is something that's more realistic? And I think that for us as advisors, we always look, well, how much does it really cost to get this off the ground versus what do you personally want as a founder? Because it, it's nice and it's safe. So I think that there has to be a bit of push and pull there. Like you're really trying to start this thing rather than just grab as much money as you can. Chris? I would say the thing is to remember that blockchains are networks and networks grow in proportion to the number of people who are using them. So a lot of the times you have to go to people rather than to try and wait for them to come to the blockchain. Right? And that means sometimes not putting the tech first forward, but putting their use case forward, speaking their language, and going after people who are on kind of the retail side or the institutional side who don't understand decentralization or don't care about it. Thank you, guys. Well, thank you to all of our panelists here. You guys have so much more. We could go for probably a couple of hours, and I could pick every single one of your brains for a long time, but very much appreciate your insights. Um, I think you guys got some great information. Uh, the fundamentals are critical. I think Jeremy uh, pointing out that the very first question he ever asks is, do you use the blockchain? Do you need the blockchain? And if you can pass that, usually you're on the right track in some capacity. So thank you to everyone. And Rose, blown away by those stats around China. Uh, that just kind of proves that Asia, Southeast Asia, is so incredibly important to this entire ecosystem that we may not even be aware of that true data. And that data is starting to come in. Uh, and just like you said, there's so many, 18,500 exchanges is wild. Um, but thank you guys very, very much. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much to all the panelists and, of course, our amazing moderator, Mr. Apollo Ono.